All right, y'all already know what it is. This is live, uncut, unedited. Y'all know the routine. Once we come in, we share the video. That's what we do. We share the video, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to share the video. It's live, uncut, unedited, people. Share the video. Share the video. Come on in, people. We're going to talk about mass incarceration, R wrongful convictions, wrongful convicted felons. All right, people, y'all know what it is. We're going to do what we got to do, people. All right, people. All right, I'm sorry. I'm doing two things at the same time. Y'all know what it is. Come on in, people. Come on in. We got a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. When I tell you we got a lot to talk about, we got a lot to talk about, people. Mm-hmm. We got a lot to talk about. So come on in, people. Come on in. I need y'all to share the video. I need at least 50 shares. I need 50 shares, people. 50 shares before uh before we get started. So come on with it, people. Come on. Give yourself a hand. Come on with it. Mm-hmm. I need at least 50 shares. I need 50 shares. Come on, people. Come on with it. I I need 50, 50 shares. Come on with it, people. Come on. Come on with it. Come on with it, people. Come on with it, people. Come on with it. We got 88 people so far. Come on with it, people. We got 88 people so far. Come on in, people. I need some shares. I need some shares, people. I need some shares. Live, uncut, unedited. Come on in, people. Let me pin this in. We need some shares. Come on in. This is live, uncut, unedited. Come on in, people. Share it up. I, I forgot I had to share it on my page. I'm telling y'all to share it, and I haven't shared it on my page. But live on cut, unedited. All right, let me see. I got to charge this phone up. Share it on my page. So come on in, people. We're going to, uh, I need at least 125 people. We're at 84. I'm tired of begging y'all now. Y'all better come on in. Let's do this now. Run for convicted felons. Come on in. I got six shares. Oh, no. Y'all got to do better than this. Come on now, people. Come on now. This is this is unreal. Come on now. We're better than this. I'm quite sure you got somebody that's locked up that's been wrongfully co uh, convicted. Come on now. Don't tell me you haven't. Please don't tell me you haven't. All right, I'm going to give you all uh, something to do. Those of you, um, let me know, check in where you're calling from. If you're calling from Chicago, just put south side, west side. If you're calling from out of state, just put your state, city, represent. Somebody said, can you help people with this situation? That's why we're out here. We're trying to find solutions. Our brothers are locked up in prison. And I'm going to do the best I can by putting it out here because this platform, it goes a long way. And you'll never know who's listening to the live. So, no, I'm not a lawyer. But I do want to share my life with those that have family members behind prison walls wrongfully convicted. All right, because, you know, the people in prison, they often, um, I forgot. Oh, I got a call already, calling already. 
Hey, Carl, are you ready? I ain't ready yet, but just hold on, okay? You, you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, uh... All right, just give me a give me a few minutes. I'm waiting on some people. Just be on hold. I gotta get some more people in. So just hold on. Okay. All right. All right. Come on, people. I need more people coming on in. I need more people come in. Come on in, people. Come on. Come on. Come on in, people. I'm quite sure we all know somebody that's been wrongly convicted. Trust me. If you know somebody that that the police sent to jail by putting some dope on them or anything, a gun on them. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Did you know that if the police put a murder on somebody? Let's talk about it. That's what we're here to talk about. So I need you to share it. Share it. That's what I'm talking about. Share this video. I got 40 people so far that shared this video. 40. Share this video. All right, we're going to be patient. We're going to listen tonight. We, we're not going to disrespect nobody. And, you know, that's going to be the rules. Whether you believe in the story or not, that the people are telling us, hey, we, we got to do what we got to do. All lives matter, but right now, all lives don't matter until black lives matter. And that's real talk. I don't care if it was in 1949, Jay. People are sitting in prison right now, right now, wrongfully convicted, wrongfully convicted. I'm telling you, people, this is real. It's a, a new, a new. we call it the mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow. Paul, he's waiting to come on live, but I need you guys to share it again. So we, we got to have an audience. So we can talk. Now you got some people, they listening in without checking in. Cause you can do that too. But we ain't we're not gonna worry about them. We're not gonna worry about them. We're gonna do what's right. So if especially if you're gonna come and speak, you need to share it on your page. That's what I need from you. Share it in your messenger. If you're afraid to share it on your page, share it in your messenger. Send it to a friend. Send it to a loved one. Send it to a buddy. We talking about mass incarceration. Wrongfully convicted felons. Wrongly. You know, wrongly. That's what we talking about, people. This is live, uncut, unedited, people. Come on, people. Share it. Check in where you're from, west side, south side, New Orleans, Texas, Iowa, wherever you're checking in from, let me know. Come on, people. Come on. I got one call away, and he's ready to come on in to tell his story. He's ready to come on in to tell his story, people. This is live, uncut, unedited, people. Share it on your page. Share it on your page. Share it on your page. Dr. Sanders, she's going to come in and talk about that as well. But I got one person before her, one person called. Hey, Dr. Sanders, how you doing? God bless. God bless, God bless you. I, uh, I got one person before you. So you got to be a little patient. You know, just be a little patient. I got one. I just want to put you on the screen. So I'm going to get, get started. I'm going to get started. So those of you, I need you guys out there to share this video. This video is live, uncut, unedited. Let me get my brother on the phone now. Let me get him on the phone. Let me get him on the phone. Cause I, I think I hear him talking. All right, hold on. Let me get him on the phone. Get him on the phone. Let me, let me get him on the phone because he's talking. Hold on. Okay, brother, you up now. You got uh, uh, anything, any devices, a TV or Facebook is on. I need you to cut that down. Cut all that down. This live, uncut, unedited. Yeah, did you turn it down? Cause you can't listen to Facebook and talk on it. Cause it's gonna be it's, it's gonna be like an echo, a delay. So you gotta turn it all the way down, brother. All the way down. 
Because if you can't do it, I can't I can't let you come on the live. I still hear some brother. Come on now. I hear it. Turn it down. If not, I'm going to have to hang up and go to the next caller. I don't hear nothing now. Okay, now go ahead and talk. Where you calling from? I'm calling from the South Side. How I know that, bro? Okay, South Side. How old are, how old are you? I'm huh? 41. You're 41. So yeah. what? this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Let, let me just get it. We're talking about, this is what we talk. We're talking about wrongful convicted <laughs> felons and mass incarceration. The new Jim Crow, that's what we're talking about. So what you got to share with us about that today? All I got to do and say is we got to bounce back on these people, man, because they doing us wrong. Who is they? It's, it's, who is they? You, you know who they is. No, you can't, brother. This is live on Cut Unedited. Keep it 100. The, the, the light-skinned people. Okay. All right. Not the black brothers. Okay. <laughs> The white people. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Say it, man. This is live on Cut Up Okay, we're going to make it unedited and uncut and all that. That's right. They still doing us wrong. We, this still slavery. It's just a new form of it. That's right. That's what it is, man. That's right. They don't want to see the what. <laughs> okay, let me ask you a question. Explain yeah. to the audience how this is slavery. Explain to them. So they had no. I already know, but I want you to explain to the audience. Okay. First of all, you got brothers getting locked up, but you still got white people and police officers <laughs> killing us on camera. Okay. And you still not getting the picture. Like, how, how, how long do it take you to see this big ass video to see that this man is killing this man? Mm hmm. How many times you got to watch this damn video to see that you didn't kill this damn boy and he ain't did shit to you? If I spit on your white ass, it's going to be a problem. Well, let me ask you a question, brother. Have you ever been locked up before? Come on. Plenty of times. Okay. You, you have, you, are you a felon? Yes, I am. Okay. Did, you, uh, would you, did they catch you or they made you plea bargain so you can come home? Where was it? Basically, my first case, 17, you know, I ain't know nothing about it. I'm out there fresh in the street. Really was a schoolboy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I ain't know what was going on, and I pleaded, but they called me. Okay. They called me. I pleaded. Got probation. Okay. But they still got their foot on your neck. Mm hmm A white boy can kill somebody. <laughs> on tape. And still don't get much trouble. We, look, you just caught me with a nickel bag of weed. And now I'm going to get probation for a nickel bag of weed. This nigga just killed. This white boy just killed somebody. Mm. Wow. So, so, so what you're saying is that the white people get the slap on the wrist. Man, that ain't even a slap on the wrist. That's just a rub on the hand. Oh, okay. They slap us on the wrist the first time, and then after the first time, it's over with. Yeah. Well, let me say this to you now. According to the Constitution, the law, we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But you know, a lot of times we're guilty until we prove our innocence. Then I, 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 and I ask that question all the time. Like, if I'm innocent until proven guilty, why am I handcuffed and got to go to jail? Mm -hmm. That's what I ask. So... What? Uh, that shit don't make no sense. Well, let, me, let me say this too to you, brother. Now, you know, slavery is legal inside the penitentiary prison system. It's legal. Uh, first of all, it's uh, legal. First of all, first of all slavery, slavery been legal. Right. Right. Fucking buildings on this damn land now. Ain't nobody really digging up dirt and on chains. They locking your ass down. Yeah. Like a fucking animal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But these white boys get out here and do some crazy shit. They take you to McDonald's, play league, how you a cup of coffee and talk to your daddy and all that shit. Well, why you think that's that way? It's still slavery, bro. 
But I'm asking. People, I'm asking. Okay, uh, okay. Look, all this policy, sh all this politics shit. That shit is dead. That's what they want you to see on TV and don't these people. These people is not teaching these kids what the fuck is going on in school. They just want to make a little check. Now who they fault? Is, but who fault is that? If 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 our children ain't le are learning, who fault is that? Is it theirs or ours? Well, uh, I'll give out eighty percent ours and like twenty percent theirs. Cause why are you sending us to school when you lying to us? Mm -hmm. I get eighty percent to the parents. Okay, I, I want to ask you a question. I'm gonna let you go. I need to ask you this question. Have you ever heard of that law that they they had out called the Jim Crow? Did you know you know anything about that? I know a little bit about it. But Tell I me what you know. Right. But t yeah, <laughs> tell me what you know about it. Um, you know, since they wasn't telling us about it in the school, I learned about it probably like my late twenties, probably early thirties. Okay. This man was selling. They taking the black man from the, the mama and the kids. No, that's not gonna happen. They take it. I ain't, how you gonna take a man from their motherfucking family? And then y'all, man, I, I, go, I go there. Okay. The little stuff I do know, that shit wasn't right. Mm hmm You taking a man from his family, you going to make him slave to do all this. You taking the lady, you doing who, who knows what with him, and you raising the kids to do the same shit. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, they were selling us. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm gonna leave you know, it. That shit. I'm gonna leave it right there, brother. I got another caller waiting on the live to come in. Thank you so much for calling in, bro. Yeah, and, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna hit you back. Right? Oh, uh, hey, hey, make sure you share this page, though, man. Share it. Send it uh, to we somebody. Do. Okay, my man. All right, peace out. All right. Doctor Sanders. God bless. I Dr. will share Sanders. this. I'm gonna share this right quick. If you look at the screen, it says two men convicted of killing Malcolm X will be exonerated after decades. We're looking here at, of course, our two men that were framed in the murder of Malcolm X. You, you, you know, of course, Malcolm, I took the Malcolm X, Mal, Martin, you know, I took the Malcolm X course with my professor, Professor Rahman Abdul Muhammad. But look at how long mm -hmm. these men, it took them to exonerate them, which J. Edgar Hoover and the New York Police Department had them framed because they needed somebody or somebody's to take the fall. And they picked men that had criminal backgrounds. It took them 55 years of these men to serve 20 years of the killing of Malcolm X, which his daughter, Ilyssa, is in the production right now. It's a sad shame before society that our men get framed for things that they had nothing to do with. Even if they were standing outside or even if they was just on the corner or with a group, just the thought of them being a part of the nation of Islam during that time, they used them and this is what happened. This is why I tell a lot of people, if you don't know a story behind something, research it. I had the pleasure of being in the same class with Malcolm X's niece, Deborah. And a lot of the things that went on with the death of and killing of Malcolm X have been gone uninvestigated. But it took a black man, my professor, Rahman Abdul Muhammad. If you go on Netflix and look at who killed Malcolm X, he interviewed Muhammad A. Aziz, and there are videos of Khalil Islam who actually spent 20 years they were framed. How many of our black men and our black boys are being framed by the white man? Jim Crow ain't no joke. We see what's happening to Emmett Till. If you know that, that they put out a production, Emmett Till's cousin was one of my classmates in the seminary. But look at what it says. Two men convicted. And they didn't have nothing in their hands. Not a gun, not a popsicle. Not even a, a stapler. But look what happens 
55 years of Malcolm X death, 20 years serving mm -hmm. in the prison. I want to I want to show that with you, Martin, because people don't understand it. This is serious. These these men lost relationship with their family behind all this mess. You understand what I'm saying? And it it, it yes, divides family. So this yes, is does. something I want to share with you all. I know you got a bunch of callers, um, but this is real serious. It's a lot of cases like that one you just said. It's a lot of cases. A lot of cases. A lot of cases. Yeah, it's a lot of cases like that. A lot of cases. See, like I, let me let me just say this before you go leave, Dr. Sanders. One thing I like about Kim Fox is she making these people, these officers here in the city of Chicago, dot their I's and cross their T's. They can't, they can no longer bluff men and women into felonies. Right. They have to have concrete evidence now. Right. Mm -hmm. They have to. Right. Mm -hmm. So many people have pleaded, plea bargain for felonies mm -hmm. just to get out of jail mm -hmm. and just didn't do the jail. crime. Just to get out of jail. Just to get out of jail. Just get out of jail. Because they don't have, they can't afford legal attorney. The other man called it the public pretender. Uh-huh. That's all it is. That's all it is. And you know the so, crazy part? It's, yeah. Was, people don't want to understand it. But look at what Hoover did. Hoover called Elijah Muhammad to silence him. Now, you know Bean Pies ain't built that temple. Come on, Martin. We all know mm -hmm. Bean Pies ain't built yeah. no temple. Yeah. But the, the, the type of threat that goes, just like with Emmett Till, I mean, come on. That white woman, I believe, was having other affairs and probably with some black boys and just nailed Emmett Till. And he's, he, he, you know what I mean? So this bluffing has to stop. But our people got to start speaking up. They got to stop playing. But they're afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid to speak up because. Because their rights are like limited. Because if you're afraid to speak, then what are you protesting for? They're afraid. I mean, because you you got to you got to remember, Doctor Sanders, uh, America used what you call a bully tactic. They know it. We call it a uh, passive aggressive behavior. Yeah. Okay, since you want to speak out on racism, we're gonna fire you. We're gonna give you a hard time on the job, See. and you know you have a house to pay for and a family and all that. So that. That right there makes people be quiet. I can't afford to lose my job. See? Lose See? my wife. See? And they know it. They know it. And can't trust God at they, all. No, they now you know they ain't doing that now. You know that that's just acting too much. But you see That's acting too much. Martin, look at this. Martin, look at this. Twenty years. Twenty years. Mm -hmm. The other one to the left. I'm looking at I'm looking at it on my other screen. Yeah. He's living. I'm looking at Dr. Sandy. When you see me looking away, I'm looking at my other screen. The other, okay. the, the one with the hat on, he's living. The other one on the right, he's uh. dead. His son can only speak from what his father had shared with him. They never killed, never killed Malcolm X. Mm. But J. Edgar Hoover made sure to unite with New York Police Department, which came out last year, that they filed that it, the the the, the Shabazz family filed a lawsuit against the state of the state of New York Police Department because they were the ones who murdered him under the execution of J. Edgar Hoover. This is real. This is for real. Now what? How many black men yeah. fit these shoes? You understand what I'm saying? And I think, sister, Google real quick how many uh. How many black men that we have locked in the prison in America right now? Google that for me. I okay. think it's a couple of million. A, a yeah. couple of million, you said? Hey, Los, I got one before you, so you got to hold on. All right. How many black men? Google that for me. Yeah, locked up in America right now. I'm doing it now. Yeah, African Americans, yeah. I believe it's, it's a couple of million. I believe it's a couple of million. Okay. And I'm going to tell you. Go ahead. Let me say this while she's looking, people. It, let me just say this to you. Go ahead. Go ahead, 2016, 2016 2.2 2 million Americans have been incarcerated, which means for every 100,000, there are 655 
who are currently inmates. Black okay. ranked 4,347. White men, 678. 91 female white and 260 black women. Incarceration. Okay. I'm looking for the I'm I'm looking for the number like a number, like a number. So we can, so so we can say so many thousands. Well, the number, the number the number that I'm for. looking at, we're talking about, and we talking about all together. No, just I want to see what this uh, disparity report on blacks, African American. Right, the blacks. See, we. Mm -hmm, go ahead, brother. Because we're the one the most incarcerated. Because you know all the rules are enforced on us. All the rules are enforced on us. So you Somebody know Somebody else can commit. You know mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm looking at. I'm looking at. We I know it's it's, it's it tripled up the amount of forty eight thousand forty three in the juvenile system. So, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and let somebody, if you find it, just come on back in and talk to me. Okay. Or t put it in the screen or okay. call me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, Dr. Sanders. All right. I got two callers on. I got to take one. Okay, caller. You got to turn your Facebook down, and then we, we got, I'm not going to let you talk. Turn it all the way down because you can't talk to me and listen at the same time. Okay, I can hear you. Hold on. Let me put it up with they so they can hear you. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I can't hear you now. Oh, hold on. Hold on. That's my fault. My fault. My fault. Hold on. That was my fault. Go ahead, brother. That was my fault. Go ahead. Okay, Martin. I just want to share some very uh, important uh, information. Uh, concerning people that's uh, wrongly wrongfully convicted and incarcerated. Uh, this last year in 2021, the uh, 10th Circuit Lower Federal Court if, say you had special probation, past probation, deferred adjudication, 1410 probation, type of probation, a, a drug treatment probation, or something like that. You're not a convicted felon, okay? So what they doing in Chicago and other places and other counties, uh, they they terminate you unsatisfactorily, or they say you violated. And what they're not doing is they're not reporting to the federal government that hey, your your probation is over and you wasn't never sent to jail. In order to be a convicted felon, according to federal law is you would have to be sentenced to one year and one day in prison. So say that you're on task probation and you get arrested. Okay, the judge got a grid that he has to go by that tells him your first warrant uh, probation violation is three days. So three days in jail, that, that's all he could get. Then you get out and you violate again. It might be two weeks to a month in jail. But long as you never, you can look this case up. It's called U.S. versus High High C H I S E Y. It just was ruled on in 2021. Long as you never made it to one year and one day in prison, you're not a convicted felon. What they're doing is they're not vacating the arrest of your rap sheet. See, I'm going through that now because uh, your, your plea, if you go get your rap sheets and look at them, if you got a plea uh, found finding of guilt, but it has a statute behind it, which is going to be like uh, 720 ILS-1014, that's the 1410 probation. That's a statute. It's not a conviction. Okay, hold, so a lot of people hold it. Hold it, brother. Hold it. Hold it. Okay. okay, so I'm just trying to understand you here. So you saying that if I'm just using myself as an example, if I plea bargain for a felony case, would you say a felon, you know, a, a, right. and never do prison, but I only do probation. So you telling me that's not really a real felon or what? Is that what you're saying? 
for deferred adjudication, past probation, 1410 probation. If your rap chief say a special probation, say you were sentenced to two years special probation, right? then no. And if you look behind your, your plea or finding of guilt, if it's a statute behind it, then that means that you was not convicted, but you were sent to uh, treatment in lieu of the conviction. Now, straight probation it, over a year, yes, that's a conviction. But if you had ta task probation, 1410 probation, any special qualified uh, uh, probations, no, it's not a, 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 a felony conviction. And, and uh, if you get to Chicago rap seat, if you've ever been on uh, special probation and you look at the guilt, guilty plea, it's going to have a statue behind it. Okay. okay. Give us this number. Give us this case number or uh, um, law number, if you can give, give the, it to us. The, 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 the case is called U.S. versus High C. H I S E Y. It was ruled on by the 10th Circuit Law Federal Court in 2021 to a guy that was caught with a gun. Uh, they got a pistol case, UW fel felon in possession, and the federal court said because he was he was on task probation, he had completed his task probation or whatever, he violated it, but he was never sent to prison. So uh, he was terminated from probation. He, he caught a gun case. Uh, the federal court looked at the case, and they said that they could not convict him as felon in possession because he never served one year and one day in prison. It's a crime punishable up to, that's where they get you. It's, it's, it's like bird play, a crime punishable up to uh, over one year. But if you haven't did that time, then it's not a conviction. They sent you the, the, the treatment. That's why if you look at the rap sheet, the Chicago rap sheet or your Illinois state rap sheet, behind the plea of guilty, it's going to have a statue behind it. And then when you go get your F get fingerprinted, go get your FBI rap sheet, what's going to come up is an unresolved arrest. Yep. So it's going to look like, look like the same, almost like a fuse deal. Because when you get these special type of probations, you need to have it vacated as soon as they give it to you. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So yep. it don't show up on the rap sheet. So okay. a lot of people is getting caught up and thinking that they have prior felonies and letting these people swindle them into jail, uh, uh, saying this is their second prior offense or whatever. But that's not true in the, in the federal court. If you look it up, U.S. vs. I.C., 2021, the federal court says if you've been on these special probations, whether you violated or not, and we had to go sit in the tank for three days to talk to the judge, and he reinstated it, and he never sent you to prison for one year and one day, that you're not a convicted felon. Okay. Well, put that number out there. I'm going to let you go. Man, this phone blowing up, man. Put that up. U.S. versus High, US versus high C. 10th uh, Circuit Lower Federal Court. Okay. Thank you, brother, for calling in. Thank you so much, brother. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Peace out. All right. All right, Carlos, you on live. What's happening, Martin? What's going on? Talk to me, brother. Talk to me. Man, I want to just talk to the people a little bit from the educational part. Okay. Well, hold on before you do that. Carla, you going to you next in line. You got to wait. Somebody's before you. Okay. You want to talk to the callers about, I mean, talk to uh, the people about the educational part of what? So. Of what? It's all, it's all tied into the criminal system. So I used to be, I'm a former Chicago public school teacher. Uh, I'm also a youth advocate. So basically, the kid, the tip. After they take these standardized tests, if they don't meet the curriculum by the third grade, they already know that these kids are going to jail. So one of the problems, they know it's a lack of men teaching, the, particularly the boys, and then the, 
if you don't have fathers in the home, this is what you have. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, bro. Y'all see Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll let you know when I, I stop. Just keep talking. So, so another problem we have, and this is something we really need to seriously think about as a people, with the lack of men in the home by some men being gay, men being locked up, men on drugs and not in the home, women are going to have to seriously think about sharing men. Now, I'm not saying this is for the man's personal gratitude, but that way we can bring the families together. Like, so if the man decides to take on this, that means he's responsible to also raise the children. So now you're raising the village together. We got to get back to a village. The village is gone. So, and to the sisters, you see, the men and women both play a part. The men have to do their part by being there for the children, but we already know that the system is designed for the man not to be there. That's why you have sex in eight for women to live free, and that's why jobs are given more to women per se, where they get promotions, degrees, and now the woman pretty much is taking over the spot of the man. So, like, my grandparents, my grandfather was the head of the household. The household I was raised in, my mom was a teacher. My father was clearly the person over the household, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a this is a we, we got to realize we are at war. And we have to strategize like we're at war. And if we don't, this is going to continue to happen because what's happening now, like, you have the killing, the little boy that got killed down by Bronzeville High School. So you got to look at the areas. It's about they don't, the, the powers to be do not care about this. They want the property back. So now when black people run for cover, they're going to come get the property and then they're going to shut us out forever. Because they're going to revitalize the communities without, without us being here. Okay. St Carlos, st st hey, st Los, Los, I need you to stop for a minute. I want to inter uh, interrupt you for one minute. Listen, while you're educating us, let the people know this is not about people doing crime and not going to jail. It's not about that. It's the overall picture. We know if you go out there and shoot somebody, likelihood you're going to go to jail if you get caught. We know that. So I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm saying that in your defense because, you know, you have some people on here, well, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. But, see, they don't see the, the bigger picture of what's going on. So they, I could go ahead. Down. When I was a I, I was a school teacher, right? CPS. Right. Oh, so I have a unique perspective because I taught at two schools. One was Brighton Park. This was an Hispanic school. The other school I taught at was uh, Arthur Ashe. So what I would do, the first thing I would do is I wanted to get to know the kids. So say I got 35 kids in the classroom at the Brighton Park. Out of those 35 kids, 33 of them have contact with their father. I would say 30 live with the mother and father. At the, in the black schools, if out of those 35 kids, 10 of them, I would say 15 might even know the father, 10 might have contact. I've actually, because I taught at this school for years, it was instances where three out of 35 kids actually lived with it. I'm going to give you a story about a guy I don't want to give his name. I had him in sixth grade, and they, he, I made, made him write an essay. This young man decided to write an essay about the day my life changed forever. Martin, when I tell you, when I read the paper, I cried, you know, the, the, 
when we send the kids to the gym, library, that's called resource. Right. Because I could not understand, because I was rough. I was doing borderline things back then. I left the board in 2002, 2003. So the things that I was sort of doing right now, I would probably be on the news. You know what I'm saying? But I could not understand why I could not get through to him. When I read this paper, it was called The Day My Life Changed Forever. He said that his father left on a Sunday morning to say that he was going to get milk, bread, and a newspaper. He did not hear from his father for years. And then he said, finally his father contacted him and said he was coming. He never showed. In the paper, Marty said, I hate my father. I hate that I was born to this life. And by me coming from a family that had a mother and father, I had seen it, but reading that essay really made it hit home like, man, we got a serious problem. So the, the reason the kids is wrong that kids are doing this, but we got to ask ourselves why. The reason they're doing it because we failed them. The, the kids have been failed. And so the community is ready to die. If you if you can sit and talk on Facebook, do this. If you, if we as men are not willing to go in the streets to do something about it, it's not going to change. The kids in the street will respect if they see these men out here. I'm going to go in on fraternities and sororities because I'm a member of a fraternity. What are we doing? If you got time to go... It's Sigma business, it's Kappa business, it's Mason business, it's Baptist, this church business. Nothing is more important than keeping the community safe. So right now, all business has to stop until we keep get the community back to it. Which means men got to come to the front line. Men are going to have to be willing to put their life on the line. It's that simple. And the reason... Cops do us like this. People say, well, why do cops do this? Because they're saying that we allow this to happen to women and children. No other community would let this happen. Asians, Mexicans, Chinese, Indian, Arabs, no other community would allow, allow this to happen except us. Because the bottom line, we are cowards. We claim we're religious. We claim we believe in God. What God do you believe in if you not? What are you scared to die for? You say you believe in God. You say you going to heaven. How the hell you get there? What you scared to die for? So you, you are we being hypocrites? What the hell you going to church for every Sunday? Let me talk about churches. What are they doing? What are churches doing? Where's the money that's going to all these congregations? And I'm not saying all our churches, but damn it, state back Salem, all these major churches, where are they getting the money to build? Where's the money going that the, the parishioners are giving to the, to the congregation? I don't see anything for the kids. Where is the money? The politicians, what are they doing? And the people simply is up to we the people. Get, we got to get our lazy ass up and go to the alderman's office, congressman, to the school. Martin, when I was a, when I was a teacher, parents didn't even come to the report card pickup. How do you not come pick your kids, your kids report card up? Do you know what that how that makes a kid feel? You don't even care about. It. But see, what we want to do, we want the kids to put, we want to let other things raise the kids. Well, folks, what do you mean? The cell phone, the video game. Where do you think they learn how to carjack? It's right in GTA, Grand Theft Auto. It's right in the game. What music are you listening to? Well, I don't want to listen to that drill shit. You need to listen to so you will know what's in their mind. It's right in the music. You don't even know the neighborhoods. 
the neighborhood. They have certain neighborhoods. This group is beefing against this group. So if you have kids, it will behoove you to know what they're doing. But now everything is more important. I want to go watch the Bears. I want to take the trip to Vegas. I want to get women want another the guys more important than your kids. How can you lay up with a guy and you got kids? If you want to do grown people's things, don't do it in front of your kids. All right, brother. Go ahead, brother. I'm, I got another caller. I'll, I'll let you spread out. Come on. I'll give you another minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. When I was at that gas station out in shape, protesting with women were the main people going in that store. When after your sister got brutally beaten, and I told people, please don't go to the store. We shut this shell down. And women said, no, I don't get Martin, excuse my language. This is black women, your sister. I don't give a damn about that bitch. I don't know her. And so we treat each other like family. Your brother, your sister, your, we got to come back as one. That's all I got to say, Martin. Thank you, brother. One plan. All right. One plan, one brain. All right, brother. Peace out. All right. All right, next caller. Next caller. Hold on, let me put you on. All right, brother. Turn your turn everything down. Then you can speak. I'll turn, I'll turn down. We're uh, good. Okay, we good? All right, brother. Yeah. All right. Um, my name is Earl Walker, if y'all don't know. Um, I'm gonna start this out by letting y'all know I was wrongfully convicted. I didn't cop out. I was facing 30 years, and I said, bitch, you won't have to give me all 30 of them because I'm not going. I was wrongfully convicted and sat in jail for uh, 12 years, 85% of, of 14 years. I also got a master's in criminal justice, restorative justice advocate, social justice advocate, and I got receipts behind this shit. So since we're talking about wrongful conviction, people have to understand in a bigger picture, I'm going to shoot to slavery and come back real quick. Okay, and go ahead. At some point in time, white folks figured out that black folks were the majority in this country. So everything that you've been seeing has been done to depopulate black people, period. If you think about how many black people are incarcerated, how many babies are lost or not born because you got 800,000 black people incarcerated? How many families have been disrupted because you put so many black men and black women in prison? So it's destabilizing our communities at an alarming rate. I'm going to tell y'all something called the Mumford Act. Mumford. The Mumford Act in California. So when the Black Panthers was doing what they was doing to protect my communities, Ronald Reagan, that whole ass nigga that did the, the, the drugs and all that in the 80s, he made the Mumford Act while he was the governor of California. And it prevented people from having firearms. What's the best way to protect your community? To be armed. To bear arms. The Second Amendment. But by per the Mumford Act, if you get convicted of a felony, you can't have a firearm. So you see how many people are being convicted of felonies? So that should open your mind to why wrongful convictions are such a big thing in the black community. It has nothing to do with conviction. If you sold drugs, if you did the crime, if you robbed somebody, of nothing. It's systematic oppression. It's white supremacy. So know that first before you go into the conversation. So if you got a question, I'll listen. But I still want to tell my story. Okay. Uh, one question is, can you explain mass incarceration? I definitely can, because when Michelle Alexander dropped the documentary, The 13th Amendment, uh, The New Jim Crow, which was The 13th Amendment, mm -hmm. I actually went around and did a series on behalf of it, and I was the moderator for this documentary and letting people know what it is. So mass incarceration is a underhanded way of slavery. It's called involuntary servitude. It's in the 13th Amendment. So it says no one can be uh, uh, induced into slavery except by commission of a crime. So what were the first versions of mass incarceration by per crime? It was vagrancy laws. So after slavery, when they did through the period of Reconstruction, 
they had all these vagrancy laws. So if I catch this nigga in a sundown town or somewhere where he shouldn't be, because I'm white or anywhere a nigga is, is somewhere he shouldn't be, I can actually arrest him due to this vagrancy law because, nigga, you don't have a job and you don't have an address. Sound familiar to registration that niggas are currently going through? So you don't have a, a job and you don't have an address, you're automatically booked into the system at whatever amount of insurmountable time that, that we know you can't do. So now we're building upon let's recreate what slavery looks like. You know why? Because the actual the, the a- average citizen will say, well, my community's safer if you got a criminal off the street. He ain't a criminal. He's just been wrongfully convicted for a BS crime. And most people miss that. Mm-hmm. Okay, another question. Um, what about these laws? I call them... Uh... I call it discriminatory laws that's made for black people, uh, made for made for black people to keep them down. For us in the uh, criminal sector, let me give you an example. Like, um, the, remember when the crack? I don't know how old are you, but when I was from the '80s, and we had the crack epidemic, late '80s. I mean, it was booming, money everywhere, money. It was more crack than guns. Now we got guns and more than drugs. It's, it's reversed now. The gun, I mean, it's the same thing, brother, because I lived through it. What we see now is so many shootings and killings, so many uh, guns out here. It was the same way our communities were full of crack drugs. Now, give you an example. We'll just say the Robert Tellers, the Cabrini Green, or uh, the Henry Hornets and all that. Now, for people to be on low income, subsidized, poor but you can you can count on that you can go to any one of the builders and you can purchase some drugs why is that the poorest communities in in the city of chicago but that's where you can go buy the drugs from wonder why now same example here in chicago right now on the south side the west side out in the hundreds you can get a gun man every teenager it's just about have a gun on them, man. It's so plain. It's so easy. I know a guy that's living from pillar to post, but he can sell you some guns, brand new in the box. And I was like, man, where you get them guns from? Dude, don't worry about it. So well, he, he, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Death, death is the death is the new crack. So that's what I'm, I'm saying. 43. I'm 43, so I, I I I know exactly what you're talking about. I live, I lived through it. I saw it. I, I did it myself. Statute of limitations is up. Yeah, I sold crack, so we don't. Oh. Yeah, I did. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. it is what it is. Right. Um, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I see the turmoil and how it tore down the community um, that fast. Well, death is the new crack. Think about it. Even with, in the sense of pay attention to a lot of these million millionaire rappers that are dying and all this type of stuff. If you think the record company don't have a hand in seeing that Tupac made more money when he was dead than alive, and they're not using that same formula against our young black brothers that's getting money in the, in the record uh, industry, then you lost. So death is the new crack. So they're pushing murder within our communities. Why? It destabilizes the black uh, uh, family, which they found to be the biggest uh, uh, supporter of black unity back in the 60s. So they was on top of that. So it disrupts the community. Mass incarceration disrupts the community. And on top of that, I'm, I'm going to tag you in something that I did call, uh, it was a, a panel on long-term sentences where we sat around. A lot of us had been locked up for decades or whatever. And this type of stuff, we had a conversation. I'm going to tag you in it so you can see it. But point being, death is the new crack. And they push it within our communities hard because they understand one person dies, one person goes to prison. I just got two on one, one stone. And it, it reinforces white supremacy, and it reinforces destabilizing our community. Gentrification, uh, they saw when Harold Washington won, they wanted to de- decentralize the, the, the black power base. So they started to break down Chathams and move people out of the, the projects. Because Big Mama and them in the projects still voted. So you still had a commanding fist when it came to black uh, politicians. So if you look at gentrification, they do it to shut down and move people. I'm going to tell you something that's cold that they do. Yeah, hold on. So, hold that thought, Earl. Let me say something. I'm looking at the comments. Charles mm-hmm. Phillips Jr. said, how crack carries mandatory time known in black communities as opposed to pure cocaine that carries probation 
that our white counterpart will be more likely than more likely to have. Because black, the average black person can't, doesn't have the, the financial means to serve powder cocaine. They don't have the financial means to serve powder cocaine. They don't have the financial means to buy large quantities of, 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 of powder cocaine. The, 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 the users themselves don't have the money to buy large quantities of powder cocaine. So it's, it's easier, it's easier to let the poor hang themselves mm -hmm. because you're manufacturing a drug. When you get pure powder cocaine, it's not, you're not manufacturing a drug. You didn't have to do anything except sell it. So you have to know the law. It's not manufacturing. When you got powder cocaine, it's just distribution or selling or whatever it may be. And the average black person is in a position to sell it at large uh, quantities. So that, that answers this question. Um, but yes, um, me, I, I'll speak a little bit about myself. I went to prison from college. Went to prison from college. Uh, I started college when I was 16. Um, I was a dropout. I ended up going back. I was in Champaign. And I was wrongfully convicted for a rape. I wasn't going to go into the people and say, hey, man, y'all convicted. I, I committed this rape, you know what I'm saying, whatever, whatever. And again, this is public record. Don't take my word for it. You can actually look at my transcripts and see the, the, the young lady that accused me get on the stand and say, I seduced her. That's what it says, black and white, you know. So, but at the point that it happened, I couldn't understand why I was in that position, but I didn't understand the politics of mass incarceration. I didn't understand the politics of destabilizing the black community. You don't look back over your shoulder and say, how he get three murders? He might not have three murders. How he get this rape? He might not have one. This nigga Snoop just bought death row, and somebody came out and said in 2013 that he, had a, uh, he committed sexual assault. Don't believe every fucking thing that you hear, but people do. They run with it because it's sensationalized. But back to myself, that's what happened. I was facing 30 years, and I told him you would have to give me all 30. There was no way I was copping out. Here's some science for the, for the, for the young cats that's out here in the streets that's getting these petty felonies and whatever they're doing. If everybody went to trial, you would bankrupt the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again for people that's actually listening. If you go to trial for a petty weed for possession or a, a, a possession of a stolen motor vehicle that you didn't carjack or whatever it may be, you, you stole a thousand dollars worth of goods. If you go to trial, all, you in jail anyway. You in the county co collecting time anyway. You gonna cop out and go to the joint anyway. Hold that thought, bro, brother Errol. Hold that thought. Let me tell you the call. Caller, I got someone before you. Just hold on. Go ahead, brother Errol. Go ahead, brother Errol. Go ahead. All right. So, so just go to go to trial and bankrupt the system. Go to go to trial and bankrupt the system. So if you, if if everybody goes to trial, you think they're gonna spend ten, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars for everybody to go to trial and put up juries and all this type of stuff? No, it would bankrupt the system. But if you're gonna play the game, you need to know how it works. So again, I reiterate and let you ask whatever question you need to ask. Mass incarceration is about the destabilization of the black family, the black, black community, because they understand a bigger picture, and we don't. So we find ourselves in these positions of copping out to stupid shit that we know we didn't do. It doesn't matter if I know about a murder. If I didn't commit it, I'm not going to cop out to it. You're going to have to give it all to me. Everybody ain't a soldier like that. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure our community understands wrongful conviction if a if a person comes out and they're too too strong too strong for the system they can't do what they did in the 60s and 70s and murder us in cold blood so the two things they use now they wrongfully incarcerate which is one mm -hmm. and they publicly lynch they publicly lynch explain so that publicly... explain that to the uh audience go ahead okay so a public lynching is um Let's just say, if he did it or not, that's your own personal belief. A public lynching is Bill Cosby. A public lynching is Jermaine Dupree not paying his taxes. A public lynching is uh, the Me Too culture. They want a black man to apologize about what he did. It's shut up and dribble when you talk to LeBron. It's if you say something, we're going to castrate you like Colin Kaepernick. He was publicly lynched. 
they didn't murder they didn't murder the man physically, but they murdered everything around him and everything he stood for and the, his ability to be a man and provide for himself. Now he's a millionaire, that's different. But just imagine how it happens on a small scale throughout our community. They publicly lynch us. They will come through wrongful incarceration. Think about it. You drive down the street, you see a car full of young black men pulled over on the side of the road. The first thing that may enter to the average person's mind is, here these niggas go, they probably got guns on them, they probably was driving crazy, all that type of stuff. No, it's a smear campaign. I'm going to public, publicly humu- humiliate every young black male that you see so you will have apathy towards this young black male if I murdered his ass in the street or if I sent him away for 30 years. You have apathy because I just lynched him in the public and you didn't identify what it was. So in the long run, our community is fucked behind it. If anybody understands what I just said, give me a thumbs up in the middle of, of, of Martin's uh, uh, post. Please. Give him a thumbs up, y'all. <laughs> uh, hold on, let me check this other call. Hold on, hold on. Hey, Carla. Hey, Carla. Hey, how in the world are you, Martin? I'm good. I don't know if you're getting feedback, so I'll shut that down. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, this Mark. This Mark. Yeah, you next, Mark. Yeah, you next. So I want to talk to you next. I was hoping, I was thinking about okay. you next. So I got to call up Earl before you. I know you know Earl. So I got to call yeah, him before you. Yeah, yeah. He's on now. So okay. then I'll let you come on next. Okay. All right. Okay. All you got to do to get the feedback down is turn down. Okay. Turn down your Facebook. Okay. That's all I get to turn down. When I get on, just turn it all the way down and you will have no feedback, no echo. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mark. Just hold on. All right. All right. All right, Earl. I'm going to just wait to this call in right here. Hold on, Earl. So hold on. Somebody, I got three calls on one time. Sometimes I ask it, it hang up the other two, and I don't really want it to do that. This is a great conversation. Uh, okay, hold on. Go switch back to Earl. Okay. Uh, let me get back to Earl. Brother Earl? That was uh Mark Clements. I know you know him. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I do. Okay, yeah. go ahead, brother Earl. See, the reason why. Okay, let me, let me explain something to you. The reason why I got brother Earl talking because he has experience. He's educated in this area, so I have to give him a little bit more airtime than a normal person. Okay, so I just want to let the people know I try to be fair, and also he's taking questions. So if you have a question out there, please. Please, while I'm looking at the comments, let me know, and I'll try to read them to Earl, and he can explain some things. So thank you, guys. Go ahead, Brother Earl. Yeah, so, so just know and moving forward why it's so important to reach out to or keep your thumb on, because a lot of people say they don't do politics. A lot of people say they don't pay attention to, to prison. I'm going to give you a cold statistic that I learned while I was in prison, because when I went in, into prison, one of my guys asked me, he was like, man, now that you know that they found you guilty, we didn't know how much time I was going to get. But he's like, now that they know you, that you get, that you know you're guilty, what you going to do? I said, the next time you see me, I'm not going to look the same, act the same, think the same. And the next time he saw me, I put on like 50 pounds of muscle, grew my hair out. And it was kind of like the, the Malcolm X moment. I came home, I didn't look the same, I didn't think the same, act the same, whatever the point is. But I knew I had an agenda to learn my environment while I was there. A psychiatrist told me, because I kept getting in trouble, so a psychiatrist told me when I'm going to sit down and talk to him, he said, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, well, they keep writing me tickets and all this type of stuff and whatever, this is this, getting on my nerves, and I'm not going to conform. He said, the reason why you can't conform to prison, because it's an unnatural environment. The people that walk around prison and they enjoy that shit and they actually conform and don't get in trouble, he said, those are the people that's crazy and you need to stay away from them. But the fact that you can't adapt to an abnormal environment proves you're normal. Stay with me. If you can't adapt to the hood that you're in, if you can't adapt to this nigga shit that's going on, if you can't adapt to fuckery, it's because you're normal. The fuckery isn't. Stay with me. So here's what I learned. We went in to prison and we were we had P.O. box numbers, P.O. box numbers. They realized after the 2000 census that there was an issue that you had an influx of people that you were snatching out of Cook County left and right and putting them into this prison all over the state. 
So if there's 2,000, 3,000 people in this prison, they gave those prisons, they took the P.O. box numbers and gave it a street address. So those two, three, five thousand 5,000 people that's in that prison in that county, you became a part of that population. Mm -hmm. Guess the federal and state dollars at that point. They went through the roof. Mm -hmm. For them little small little hick towns. Small little exactly. hick towns. So the hick town that had less than 10,000 people, all of a sudden got more than 10,000 people. So they get more funded. They get, it's better. So mm -hmm. they, they're distributing the population from Cook County to the smaller counties, and they're utilizing your residency mm -hmm. in these penitentiaries for them to update state and federal dollars to boost their economies. And also right. and also to give them jobs down in there, down in the little yeah, country, exactly. them little uh, hick towns, to give jobs. His, his, Go ahead. I'm glad that you say that because a lot of people think that, oh, it's just a prison. I was in, I was in Danville for the majority of my, my stint in, in prison. You mm -hmm. know, you can look out the windows and see stuff. Right. I saw motels being built. I saw gas stations being built. I heard that a Walmart had expanded. I heard a lot of different... So I'm talking about in-the-town retail, not just the officers, not just the officers, because guess what happens? You come down to visit your man or your son or whatever it may be, and they say, that, that shirt you have on isn't appropriate. You got to go buy a shirt if you want to get in there. What did you do? You ran to the neighborhood store in their neighborhood, bought a shirt, and came back to the penitentiary and spent money while you were there. You went to that gas station and spent money. You And that's just one person. You booming the hell out the economy behind this. So you think there's no incentive to have wrongful incarceration? Let me, say this. Let me say this, Brother Earl. So, in other words, this is what Earl is saying. Off the backs of black people, criminals, if I may say that, some some guilty, some not. They building the economy, and they they're making jobs, jobs. But what I mean by that, by you being locked up in the prison system, you're creating jobs for that particular uh, place down at Danville, whatever you at, Joliet, whatever prison system that you you're building jobs. You're making jobs not only for the the prisoners, not for the guards, but also the surrounding businesses. Like the brother said, if they stop you, you can't go in, come in this visit in prison with this type of shirt on, well, what you going to do? You're not going to go all the way back home two or three hours away. You're going to run over to Walmart and get the proper tire, spend the money. You're going you're gonna to spend money at their gas station. You're going to gas up. So this brother, I didn't know he was this deep. I, I, I'm shocked, brother Errol. I didn't know you was this deep, man. I, I apologize. I did not know you was this deep. Now, I knew about Mark Clemens, but I didn't know about you. you, Trust you, me. you I've been trying to rock with you for a while, man, because yeah. I, got, I got so much stored up that, that, that I don't even want to get into because it's not on your topic, and right. I'm going to respect your note right. for the Appreciate topic it. that it is. We get into that at a later date. But okay. it's a lot that I went through and studied and found out about how the system operates and how it affects and tear us down as a people. And because of it, I've been around the state speaking about this type of stuff. I've mm -hmm. been in front of these white folks in their libraries and college campuses and telling them, you foul, and I, 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 I get it. You know what I'm saying? I get it on both sides of the spectrum because I've lived both sides of the spectrum. And I appreciate, I'm looking at some of the comments, I appreciate the people that are saying I'm on point, that's engaging with the situation because I'm just trying to enlighten people. That's all. The same mm -hmm. thing that you do. Yep, that's it. And there's nothing wrong with that, brother. But see, this is two things. I was listening to Minister Louis Farrakhan this morning, and he was saying there's two things that they hate, this system, white supremacy. They hate for a rich person to give money to poor people. They hate that. They, they, they don't like that. Then they hate for a wise person, such as Earl and myself, to give knowledge to people that don't have no knowledge. As long as they can keep you in the dark and not knowing. Going back to the scriptures, Earl, I don't know if you're a religious person, but you know, I always quote scriptures on here. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. All day. This brother educated himself. Now, he could have got into the prison system and started banging and doing everything, but he educated himself about the law, about the system. He know how the game works. It's a game, people. And if you don't know how it works, you can't play it. You will always fall as a victim. 
to this system. But when you educate it, go ahead, I'm gonna say, when you educate, go ahead, bro, go ahead, go ahead, it's getting good, go ahead. Let me shoot this money real quick, let me shoot this money real quick. Okay. So if a person goes to my page, I got certain lives where the police pull me over all the time. Like like for, for the, the 10 years after I got out of prison, I was on paper registration. I'm off now. Right. But for those 10 years, they constantly pulled me over, talk to me, whatever. And I'm talking about, I got one where the police, they pulled me over and tried to snatch me up saying that I had a gun because the informant told them. They put the handcuffs on me, sit me in the back seat. And by the time I finished telling them, I've read your police consent decree. I know what the law is. I know, I don't tell the police what my rights are. I tell them what their rights are. If you don't know the law, don't argue with the police. One. So I don't tell them what my rights are. I tell them what their rights are. So I explain to them their rights, cuss them the fuck out, and by the end of the video, they're taking the handcuffs off me and letting me go. If you ain't that cold with the law, shut the fuck up. That's just my, my opinion. That's just my opinion. You know what I'm saying? But I got plenty of those type of events of, of, of me getting into it with the police. And I purposely walk through it that way to give people real life scenarios that you can see and be like, damn. I don't have to tell the police this. No, I don't have to lower my passenger side window. No, because they're trying to use a plain view law to get you incarcerated. No, again, I got a master's in criminal justice. I digress, though. But in the midst of me doing that type of stuff, I learned what the, the, the game and the system was. So I'm going to give you a piece of game, and I'm going to get out the way. Okay. I came home with $57 to my name. $57, that's it. That's all I had to my name after been doing about 12 years in prison. So I came home and wanted to start a business, right? So after me putting together and saying, hey, I'm going to do personal training, I'm going to start my own business, I'm going to empower myself, I knew before I came home by getting certifications, get my associate's degree. I went to U of I in the, in the joint. They had a program through U of I in the joint that I went through it and learned uh, social, social justice while I was in there. Anyway, I wanted to start a business, and obviously I'm a felon. I can't get a job. I'm on house arrest, and I can't get a business loan. But guess what type of loan I could get to my business, and I finesse two birds and one stone. I can get a student loan to go to school. So I got a student loan, went to school, passed my classes, and used the student loan money that the feds gave me to not only open one business, not only open two businesses, but three. All for their money. It's, 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 it's science. It's, 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 it's so simple. The average person misses it. So when a person sit back and say, I can't get a PPP, or I don't know whatever it is. Hey, look, you can get ahead if you actually sit there and think. And I try to utilize these skill sets and give it to other guys. I, I, got, a, I got a company right now at Macklin Cleaning. You was out there. When, when, yeah, I know. When, when, right. You know, you know, you know the whole motherfucking story. You know, I ain't even going to get into that one. Right. I, I hope I Later. Anyway, my point being, I created this business because I understood there were a lot of wrongfully convicted and a lot of felons that were coming home, and they needed somewhere to pick themselves up, build up skills, build a resume. So even to this day, I still hire people, at-risk youth, returning citizens and everything with my cleaning and property maintenance company, give them the skills, help them write a resume. When you go out into the labor force, put me down as a reference so you can get on your feet and stop throwing rocks at the penitentiary. It's deep. And I make sure I, 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 I'm beholden to it so people can understand it. And you talking to, again, a wrongfully convicted person. And I didn't come home bitter. I, I mean, I was an angry black man. Don't get it twisted. You know what I'm saying? Again, I got receipts of running downtown and running up on the police and all that. I got receipts. But I took that energy and I placed it in a position to where the average person is not going to know how to navigate these spaces and learn these white folks' tricks of the trade. I'm going to apply myself and bring it back to the community. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. All right, Brother Errol, let me leave it right there. I'm going to let Mark come in, and I got one after him. Okay. I appreciate, appreciate you all day, bro. All right. Peace out. All right, Mark, I know I had you on hold all day. Your turn, brother. That was getting good. Just turn, listen, do me a favor, Mark. Do me a favor. Tur turn your Facebook all the way down. Turn your volume or TV, okay. radio. Then you won't hear no echo. All right, now. Are you hearing echo? Uh, nope, I don't hear anything. All right, go ahead, brother. I, listen, I, I don't have to explain to you. You already know, so I'm going to just let you talk. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> this is your expertise. 
you know, Brother Earl was hit it on the head. Mm-hmm. However, our system has made a killing based off of locking up young black and brown men and women in this country based off of crimes that many of them did not commit. You know, our system right now today, it needs regroup, but in wake of what we see each and every day, it makes it a very difficult challenge to rebuke the system. We as a people, we don't have in our communities, mental health facilities. When you go to a prison, it is prison officials' desire, their hopes, their goals to literally drive people mentally insane. And once they are released, many of those people are wounded and they cannot get any type of treatment. Not to mention that when people go to prison, they're working these job assignments that's making, I'm talking about millions of dollars for the state. But when these brothers and sisters are released, they cannot get one penny from the state. They struggle in housing. They struggle in readjusting back into society. And they struggle in the fields of gaining any type of medical treatment. And Mm -hmm. that is something that we as a people are acting like we can't comprehend to. Yes, I watch your videos every day, Martin. Mm -hmm. And what I see is the Wild Wild West. It was a a particular TV program used to come on back in the 60s and 70s. And it was labeled the wild, wild west. Well, that's what we're dealing with. And this is what happens when people like John Burge, he sold a seed into our community. People like this detective named Michael McDermott, they sold seeds into our community by locking up innocent people and victimizing our communities. And what they were calling right then was really wrong. And Mm -hmm. what we see is the product in our communities right now that reflect that wrong is right and right is wrong. And somehow, some way, we are going to have to learn how to love each other in this hurting society. You're listening to someone who spent 28 years inside of a prison based off of a crime I didn't even commit. However, returning back to this society in 2009, leaving it in 1983, I mean in 1981, seeing this society, this this reminds me of tarantulas. This reminds me, this is not what I left behind. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the adjustment level is going to be, it's going to take some time because you're going to run into some tarantulas out here Mm -hmm. because you don't know what exists out here in this society. And we need to demand that this type of behavior, that it comes to a stop. But the bottom line of it is, is that we're constantly running to fools because our cousin had been shot down. Our niece or our uncles have been victimized. That's because of no love out here in this society. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you, based off of experience and working in the field of wrongful convictions, I can tell you right now, we have a epidemic of young brothers, black and brown mm-hmm. people, that have been railroaded by our criminal justice system. And in closing, if you think that if I can kill 25 people out here in this world and 25 of the wrong people go to prison for what I am doing, I'm going to think that I'm untouchable. So guess what? 
going out in the middle of this. Brother Mark, hold that thought right there. Hold on, hold on, Mark. Okay, Carla, you next. Just hold on, okay? You gonna hold, okay? Okay. All right. When I when you come on, I need you to turn your uh, Facebook all the way down. Okay. I'll let, all right. I'm going back to the next caller. You next. All right. Go ahead, Mark. Mark. Yeah, I'm right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. And, and, and well, hey, I understand, man. Guess what? That's why I admire brothers like yourself because you establish your own platform. Mm -hmm. See. I recall when you, man, when you was out there and you was struggling to get maybe 20, 25 people, but it took time. It took uh, resistance and constantly keeping up with what you're doing, and you have kept it. And one thing is, is that you have kept it on both ends. Mm -hmm. Because I listened to the program yesterday, and it was on the sisters being gunned down in these cars mm -hmm. and he was explaining to them not to be getting into the cars with these brothers who basically don't want you in the car or else you know that they got a history and a record that is following them mm -hmm. so in closing people we got to start to love each other. And those brothers and sisters that are locked up in those prisons, they belong to every one of us now the whole key of it is is how can we work as a collective to get these brothers and sisters home and not only get them home but now to start to identify what the true problems are in our community so that we can put the pressure on the politicians if it's going to be any pressure to give us what we deserve we have been definitely under represented in the political field but i thank you uh for your time i thank you for your format i think that it needs to be more to go inside of the prisons and to examine why so many brothers are coming out and they're wounded and and for real closing i want people to know that there is a chicago torture justice center the only center in this country that provides counseling and other psychological treatment to people that have been impacted as the result of the criminal justice system. All you have to do is Google Chicago Torture Justice Center, and you will find out that there are some little spots in our communities where that you can get help for the things that you are dealing with. I love you all, and God bless you. Thank you, Brother Thank you, Mark. Brother Mark. Thank you, Brother. Appreciate okay. you. God all right. You. Brother Mark, we're going to do another segment yes, probably tomorrow, man. I'm going to invite you in and, uh, and you know, talk, because we, we need to keep drilling this. Sometimes we have to keep talking until we get it, man. We're just looking at the crime. I want people not only look at the crime, but look above what's going on, what's right. causing the crime. Stem stemic layers and conditions that has legally lynched us for years and years and years and guess what now they're seeing what they sold in to produce and when we tell you we are i i just said it we don't have to learn how to love each other yes, if yes, we're sir. not going to learn that we're going to destroy each other god bless you god bless you brother peace out thank oh you God, all right all right, Miss Applewhite, we got the next next caller. So turn your uh, Facebook down. Turn your Facebook down. Right, Miss Applewhite, we got the next. All right, turn it all the way down. All right, all right, you ready? Yes, I am ready. All right, I was what I was wanting to do is uh, I'm glad you came and listened. I wanted you to hear other stories. You know, we had this one particular guy. He, this last call, he'd been locked up for 28 years. He's an advocate. Then the guy before him, he was locked up for 12 years. Both of these guys was wrongly convicted. So I want you to tell us your story uh, about your brother. And, you know, go ahead. We, we're listening. Patient. Walk us through it. Thank you so much. And uh, my name, I go by the name of Tracy Nicole. I've been knowing Marty since I was knee high to a grave. Um, I, I thank you um, for letting me be on this platform uh, tonight. 
I am speaking on behalf of Courtney Bernard Clark. He was a resident born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Um, he is serving life without the possibility of parole. Um, I have noticed in all of these years, um, he has uh, a very serious medical um, situation. And I want to talk about the medical first. Throughout the years of my brother being incarcerated, which is in Minnesota, Minneapolis, he's in Fairboat, Minnesota, as we speak. My brother had a two tumors on his um, in his neck area for six years. Six years. Um, it was a man named Dr. Louis Schitzner, which um, never liked it, my brother, um, and denied him medical treatment over six years. Once he got um, approval from the state to get the surgery, now he can barely talk. He goes to bed without his meds. Um, he's not placed in a medical ward, which we're trying to fight. I have been um, doing a protest. I did a protest December the 19th to give awareness on wrongful convicted felons, um, people that are suffering in these prison systems without any help. Uh, Courtney Bernard Clark has a large family, and I am he, I am his platform. I am his spokesperson through uh, Mr. Marty. Um, let me come on this platform tonight. Hold on, y'all. Hold on, Miss Sam. She called me Marty. That's what they call me. You know, when you hear somebody call me Marty, that means they've been knowing me for years. We grew up. So that's why she called me Marty. They, I, I ain't mad at it. I love that name. Come on, sister. Go ahead. All right. So in trying to get uh, the medical treatment and the medical help that he deserves, um, I have talked to or tried to get in touch numerous times with Paul Chanel. Paul Chanel is the commissioner. I like to name drop because I want this uh, story to get out to whomever will listen. Um, somebody is everybody. And um, no answer. Uh, Michelle Smith, Michelle Smith uh, is the one that um, I tried to get correspondence to uh, via email, um, calling her um, her uh, work number. And when I say that this lady has no type of compassion, no type of concern, my mother, Patricia Applewhite, um, that's her son. She has called so many times on on this um, these issues that my brother is facing. Finally, he gets uh, treatment, which he had surgery. They put him in a hole. Several doctors came in and snatched the goals off of him while he was leaking. He was not even two days of surgery. And they, they put him back in this place where it was um, no ventilation. Um, it, it, the, the place just was horrible. Now, I want to talk a little bit about his case as well. My brother was expedited from Chicago to Minnesota by corrupt cops, Mike Duran. Mike Duran was a cop that was, he was actually under investigation with the CIA because this, um, this particular guy, which was a cop, he was giving information out to local, um, what I would call, undesirables. And um, he was, uh, I think he was convicted and had served a little time. When my brother um, obtained this charge, which um, Mike Durant would take him in the alley, have him strip naked to see if he had any wires, um, it, it, it just was a nuisance. Why was he expedited from Chicago to Minnesota? I have no idea. Um, when it was time for the charge to be put upon him, uh, because they locked him up, when it was time for court time, I have questions. I have questions and concerns of why was the family thrown out of the courtroom? Why was his lawyer told to go to another floor and just thrown out of um, the floor that held his uh, trial. Uh, we had several, several people that was on the jury. One particular man, he was Chinese descent. He said, I fear for my life with these cops. So the um, prosecution dealt with um, the, the cops 
the judge never okay for the family to be thrown out. The lawyer that was hired, she was sent somewhere else. And it, 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 it's just, it was madness. Um, by the family not standing and the judge came in, I guess he felt, you know, when you stand tall as a unit, that helps. But he had no family there. They were all thrown out the courtroom. When he got his sentence, it was um, life without parole. Um, his situation was that he was placed in a house with uh, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster died in his apartment. They placed my brother there. Now they saying that my brother was one of the people that was responsible for this man's death, and he totally wasn't. Um, in, in the courtroom, they said that he died to a gunshot wound to the head. When we got into court, then they said that he died of fixation. So basically, the information just was all over the place. You had jurors there that was half sleep, half intoxicated. Now he has a lawyer trying to fight for him, and she sent to another courtroom. Mind you, the support is everything, you know. I want to talk about um dr lewis schickner he will be uh, a man that has a lot of jurisdiction over the staff of, of this uh mind you he's from uh Fairboat, minnesota so this doctor anybody that wants to see my brother um they will be told to go to the next patient and he would put in charge another nurse or another supervisor that would treat, uh, treat them uh wrong um, I have been trying to get in touch with his nurse for over three months. I have been hung up on. I have been sent to other departments. He has cried out um, about not being placed in the medical ward because that's where he needs to be. Mind you, distant learning is a place where um, when he goes to this certain department, he has he's in a wheelchair, mind you. Yeah, hold, so hold, has, hold that thought right quick. I'm going to need you, because I hear some echo back there. You need to turn your Facebook down a little bit, because I hear, you might not hear echo, but I hear, I hear echo. Okay, it's totally down now. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, he's in the he wheelchair. To... That's where you left off at. He's in the wheelchair. Yeah. Go ahead. So he's in a wheelchair, and he has to roll himself up a steep hill. Mind you, it's 20 feet of snow, so the inmates that helps him, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the inmates that help him, they will be reprimanded, thrown in a hole. So it's retaliation. I just did a uh, December the 19th of 2021. Um, I flew out to Minnesota. And um, after the protest, he was thrown in a hole again. Uh, things was taken away. Uh, the medical staff would not see him because I was dropping names which is uh, Paul Chanel, the commissioner of Minnesota, Dr. Louis Schichner, which is a, a person that uh, literally have your life in his hands. Actually, he performed the surgery on my brother's throat, and his throat was so tight that he, when he swallows, he couldn't even, the pain was excruciating. So me being on this platform is to just bring awareness to the different things that's happening to my brother. I feel like, okay, if he's doing life without parole, even though this case, this case that he has will literally bring the judges and these cops to shame. But also, I just want to bring awareness to the mistreatment of him. He has watched several inmates die. He has brought awareness. What he's doing now is helping other uh, inmates with their cases. My brother's very intelligent, but he's no saint. Okay. But um, the criminal um, system is just, it's, 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 it's a joke. And um, if it wasn't for Marty letting me on his platform, I don't think anybody would really understand the story that needs to be out. Like, literally, we are trying to fight for him to get out as we speak. And it's a shame that he had to see several inmates die wrongfully just just did no answers to the families no type of compassion when i say that i have called and not of malice just a, a pure concern for courtney 
I, I don't want to uh, be sued for defamation of character, but I would say that these calls and these um, employees are very nasty. I had got in touch with Paul Chanel's uh, uh, lead assistant. She has no type of compassion for me. It's, it's just nasty. Um, also, I want to speak on uh, the fact that if anyone is having surgery, why would she be thrown in a hole? Literally, being placed in a place where no ventilation is, is very cold, you know, so... And he's in the wheelchair. And he's in the wheelchair. Yes, yes. With his throat open, and several doctors went into this, um, I guess, a place where they put you at, and literally snatched off the gauze and laughed. So it has been retaliation after retaliation. I just had to literally record fair vote Minnesota employees, uh, particularly um, her name is Mary McComb. She is uh, administration over the entire staff at Fair Vote Minnesota. So she's the AWA. That's her title. And um, no answers. Um, it's, 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 it's basically, I was trying to get his watch that he didn't receive from Lionel Lakes, and this has been, he's been gone from Lionel Lakes, which Lionel Lakes is another uh, correctional facility that he was transferred from Lionel Lakes to Fairboat, Minnesota. I had to record these people just to get a watch um, expedited to him. None of his things, uh, when he get his things, there's either smashed. He literally has um, over 50 um, complaints in federal court. He's in federal court with 50 complaints as we speak. So this platform means everything to me because not only I can reach the masses, but this story really needs to be told in a manner where lawyers or just your regular local people that has uh, other loved ones in, in, in places like the prison system, they need to hear this because we have to stand up for our brothers and sisters. Even though they have did wrong or they have been um, sentenced in a way and, you know, serving their sentence, no one should uh, ever have to go through that. I have pictures of my brother being beaten, laying on the floor from different inmates, from, uh, I don't know if the, the guards knew or sent these inmates to my brother, but I have pictures of that, and he's in a wheelchair. So, you know, my mother and father, just seeing that alone, the brutality that he's had faced in the years, he's been there for 17 years locked up already and counting. So I'm just trying to make a difference. I'm trying to stay strong and, and be very vigilant and, and have a voice uh, to speak when he cannot speak. Because all too often, we as family members, you can't get tired. The fight goes on because I refuse for my brother to die in a prison system. I refuse that. Mm, okay. Anything else? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I have I have more to say. I just have to pause a little okay. bit because um, it's, it's very it's a very emotional thing. And what I want to um, um, say to anyone that can hear this story, pass it along. Um, Marty has been my he's been on me since I was five years old, and um, it's just amazing what he's doing for um, the community as a whole. Um, I have followed him for so he, he's he's a busy man, okay? <laughs> he's a very busy man. So you know, I just told him today, this is definitely divine intervention. Definitely, the ancestors is with this brother because if I wouldn't call him today, I wouldn't been as tall to stand up and speak about my brother's uh, the brutality, the mistreatment. Um, he's not a dog; he's a human being. Even though he had did wrong. He's trying to make his right. I would like to say, I just want my brother to do his time. I'm going to fight until he gets out. I'm going to scream free Courtney Clark. He is not a dog. He just want to be left alone in peace. I don't want to get in this. I don't, I, I would never get on the platform and throw the race card. I throw facts. 
I dropped names. As soon as I got on that platform in Minnesota and I spoke well, he was thrown in a hole the next day. Wow. I've talked to um, high officials, Renee Moran, Renee Moran, um, I tried to talk to her about his case and um, black sister out of Minnesota. Um, dropped the case, uh, you know, it's just, I know people have their lives, um, but I am really trying to, you know, just make a difference. Hmm. So, uh, can I ask you a question? Have you ever tried to make a petition or anything like that too? Especially for his help in there, you know, and how, I mean, he should be in a medical unit. That's what we're trying to fight for right now. Uh, we're, to, we're trying to go through Michelle Smith. Michelle Smith is the one, she's the go-to head honcho, and she can help out. I've been dealing with her for like two years, mm. and nothing has happened. Mm. Wow. Yes. It's, mm. it's, it's been a fight, and a fight, but I'm not going to lose the battle, and I'm not going to give up the goals that he's not either. Okay, uh, Mark Clements, the guy that was on before you, he said she needs to contact the Chicago Alliance Alliance Against the Political Repression at uh, Tier Pearson. It's on here. Um, he put it on. Matter of fact, I'm going to pin it down. So okay. you know, Mark Clements, the guy that was on before uh, you came on. So I'm going to okay. pin it so you can maybe you can get in contact with him because he's a great resource. He's been, he been in them tight spots. He know. Trust me. Yes. Right. Yes. So go ahead, Susan. I, Anything else? Go ahead. Yes, I'm definitely going to reach out to him. But uh, like I said before, to be expedited to Chicago, mm -hmm. um, to Minnesota, and placed in a house where Mr. Foster died, and when you get to court, everything is misconstrued. Um, just alone, the case alone holds a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, when you get out, uh, it will be... Um, Hello, Mr. Hello. I'm still here. Yeah, go ahead. Cause you got when you got out, you didn't. I thought you, you stopped talking. You know. So anything else? Oh yes, uh, I, I definitely will um stay posted and um get all this information because I I, I got time. I got a lot of time on my hands, so I'm gonna use this energy wisely. Okay. And let, let me say this too, wise in my mind. One day, I think I'm going to do a special, uh, special show, just like this for the prisoners. Peter's locked up, been locked up. And I want to, I'm going to try to do it soon where I can have Courtney call. Like, you know, when he, when he's not in the hole or anything, he can call and we can hear his voice. Will you take his call on two-way and have him speak too as well? You yes, because he's supposed to have called in tonight. Okay. But, um... When, when I'm talking to him, they know that I am a type of person that likes to record. Uh -huh. So what they'll do is, they, um, when, when I used to go on JK and I used to do video calls, they would mute him the entire time. So they know the type of person that I am. Um, it's what you can prove in court. So I'm always willing to, um, even if it's the mayor, you're going to be recorded when it comes to Courtney Bernard Clark. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I want you to hold on for a minute. I got another friend. I don't think Courtney know him, but I got another friend that was a prison guard for at least 24, 25 years uh, in the Joliet, and and I think he worked in two different ones. I want to hear him speak and just see what see what he has to say. So, okay, Chris, go ahead. Just want you to listen up. You could just stay on the phone, okay? Stay on the phone, young lady. Okay. Okay. Come on, Chris. Like I say, it's 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 a lot of corrupt police out here, man. A lot of the prison system. All they want to do is make money, but. I'm not singling out nobody. I'm not taking no sides. But us as black people, man, we got to fight for our brothers and sisters before they get in that situation. Because once they get in that situation, it's hard, man. And, and you know, I tell to all my uh, black and brown sisters and brothers that before they get locked up, because a lot of them, like, they didn't do the crime. A lot of them, I think the prison, prison system, I used to think that was innocent. But the fact they're still in there, and I just want to say to the family, you got to fight for your siblings, your loved ones, heart. And I noticed that too, Martin. 
us as black people, when they get in that system, that's when we want to start fighting for them. We got to fight before that happens, man. We know they out here doing wrong or in a in the wrong place. They don't have to be doing wrong. You can be in the wrong spot in the wrong neighborhood. And I hate to say it, is it right? No, it's not right, but it's reality. These court systems, they don't care nothing about us, man. We we can cry till we blew in the face, but until we change and we can write, we can march, we can petition, but until we start getting the people that look like us in, in them um, court systems, we can do all that we want to, man. It's not going to work. We can try. And I'm not saying when I say it's not going to work, when I say I'm not talking about office, it's always an, an, an exception to the rule. But until we start getting our people in the power places, this is what it is. Educate our kids and our people to get into that system, man. And they can control the narrative on what's going on in this court system, man. But as long as them white people control it, we don't, we don't have a we don't have a chance, man. I'm gonna agree with you on that because I remember uh, we did a protest in Mount Greenwood. That's one of the known racist area. We call it cop land, right here in the city of Chicago on the south side, mm -hmm. 111 West, right up in there, Chris. And the white guy walked up to me and a young guy, Jamal Green. The white guy walked up to us, and this is what he said. I'm gonna paraphrase what he said. He said, "We are the lawyers." the police, the doctors, and the judges. And he walked off. He told us. So in other words, he was saying that y'all don't have a chance out here marching and protesting because we are that. That's what he was saying in so many words. And I got silent. I couldn't say anything. But I caught what he was trying to say. We're the doctors, we're the lawyers, we're the judges, we're the police. In other words, we got the power. And so that's going back to what you just said. If we don't have people that's in these key power positions, not only that, now we do have people in these positions, but they have to be conscious of what black people are going through because they can get in these key positions and still work the uh, work the other man's, the other man, let me, what the word I'm looking for, the other man policy. Because judges can do what they want in a lot of cases. Yeah. They can make moves. We've seen it over and over. We've seen it, people. We've seen the videos. We've seen the slaughter of black men and how some of these cops, some of these people have got the pat, pat on the back. Or not even a cop, just being a white, white person. We know there's two sets of laws and rules. But I want to say that. Go ahead, Brother Chris. Yeah, but too, like, yeah, that's like, even though I was law enforcement for over 25 years, man, I know what's out there. So guess what? If I don't have to be out there in the streets, I'm not going out there, man, because I already know, even with my background, they don't care. They look. They don't look at the person. They look at the color. I'm black before I'm anything. They see that. And, and they hold us accountable. It's like I say, like you said, it's two different rules, man. And it's not right, people. It's not, but that's the fact, and that's the way it is. This court system is zero percent in our favor. Well, I say one percent because it's always an exception. But for the most part, we don't have a chance. When you got a light, when you don't have no money, you go in this court system. If you didn't, let's go past if you, um. Because that's not the issue. Let's go past. I know that's the issue, but let's go past you being locked up and you incarcerated now. A lot of black people don't have no money. You can't get no lawyers. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to throw us a um, public defendant, which is white. And all he's going to come in there and tell you to do is, hey, cop out. Do this because he's trying to get promoted. So that's on his, even his attorneys and his judges and um, public defendants, they all in cahoots. I, I witnessed this, man. I, I was a fly on the wall just sitting back there reading my little magazine back there in the um back there where they sit when they all come to meet out back there and they looked at me oh okay he on our side but what they said it shocked me and i tell all these i told all these inmates that they work in your case without you even being present that's against the law right there they already discussing his he and much they discussing his case man the public defendant in the state of the is just, uh, discussing his, his outcome, and he's not even in there, man. 
He's not even present. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Did you want to say something, sister? You go ahead. Hold on, Chris. Hold on, Chris. Go ahead, sister. That, 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 that definitely uh, rings the ear with me. He totally right with that. Um, I just want to say this, too. They are just a number, and they are just money. It's no rehabilitation. Um, it's, it's really no uh, correct education. They're working for peanuts. When you're locked up, when you're born, you come in with a number. When you go into that place, you're a number. So it's, 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 it's no one really there to fight and rehabilitate these brothers when they go in they are so institutionalized they're not educated they're not motivated when they get out they are lost because this world still goes when you are in it's much slower in there so they have to um come out strong and that's when family family and friends come in at. uh and i'm gonna give the mic to him Okay, go ahead, Chris. Okay, and, and what I've seen in my life over 25 years in that prison system, though, is you got some brothers in there that shop, and it's, it's a few. Don't nobody mess with them. I don't care who you are. They already know. They got their respect, and you ain't messing with them. But a lot of times, too, on the other side of that, I know they won't hear that. Some of them guys is in there, them inmates, they animals. They animals. And, and what I didn't like is how they disrespect the black brothers and sisters. They throw them a little bone once in a while when they can. They curse us out, call us all type of names and call our women all type of bees and MFs. But when the white person come in there, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I don't have a problem with that. Anyway, it should have been reversed. So we here to help you. But, it, I, but you also got to get down on the wardens, too, because they're not doing nothing either. She said you also got to get down on the wardens because they, they're not doing nothing either. Well, how, much, what, how, how, many, how many ways could I say this, man? That prison system don't care. I don't care who. If you black in that prison system, they don't even, a lot of times they don't even care about their own women. What do you think they care about a black or brown person in there? They don't care. They there for that paycheck. I don't say all. I say like 85 to 90 percent of the people coming there for that paycheck, man. With me, I used to come in, but what I used to do, man, I used to sit down and talk to these brothers and say, "Hey, man, this is not the way the ones who's getting out because the ones who had life and were fighting in cases, a lot of times they ain't want to hear nothing you had to say anyway." But the brothers who had like five to ten years, I used to sit down there for hours and talk to them, man. And a lot of times they say, man, I got to feed my family. I got to do what I got to do. And I used to tell them all the time, if you get out and you go to that same neighborhood, that same place, you're going to get the same results. And, and I'll see you again. And a lot of times you see him again, man. He said, man, hey, I learned this time. And it's crazy, man. I seen this one guy, man. He got out like four times and came back, man. Because all he said that, and he told me this too. He said this, yeah, my family was fighting for me so hard when I was in here. But once I got out, they disappeared. I had no support. And that's what's wrong with a lot of our black and brown people. When they want to support us when we get in here, but before we got in here, no support. Then they get in it, then when they get out, no support. They support them for a little while. But we got to fight as people. We got to fight hard when we know they on that path. We know they out there doing wrong, man. A lot of times, you know your brothers and sisters out there doing wrong. We got to fight just as hard before they get in that system. Because when that system is, it's not our system. It's not. It's brutal, huh? We need to stop thinking that we're going to get that thing in there that I'm calling these wardens, I'm calling this and that. The, and they not doing nothing. They not gonna do nothing. News flash. They not doing anything. They not. Is it right? No, they're hundred percent wrong because they take an oath for that job to take care of them inmates. But they don't. They don't do it, man. They don't do it, man. That is true. That is definitely true. I'm. I'm gonna end it with y'all too. So I'm not gonna take no more calls and all that. So. You, you want to say any closing remarks or something? I would like to say 
Um, and we got to pay attention to the rapes that's in these prison systems, the beatings, the mistreatment. These brothers go in. Some of them are not as strong. They are being raped. And that plays a mental on a brother. So when they get out, you know, either they are liking it and going both ways, but it, it, it's just the brutality in itself that is not right. And you got these brothers in here in the prison system that's um, doing this heinous acts and nothing is being done. It's no re rehabilitation for the mind. Once your mind goes, you're gone. You have to be strong in these prison systems because there's no one there to protect you. That would be my closing remarks. Okay. Okay. And I like brother, to say give me your closing remarks, brother. Okay. Give me your closing remarks. Uh, a lot of times, Martin, as far as I want to um, piggyback on her topic, as far as like the rapes and stuff in prison. We as officers, we, we, we can't see that. That's just like you letting your um, teenage out in the world. You can't monitor them all the time, man. You can't. And it don't take number two or three minutes to be raped in a prison. And we outnumber. But each correction officer, I, I'm not speaking for all facilities, I'm speaking for mine. I had to watch about two, 200 inmates, man. I had to watch 200 inmates. And a lot of times I had to take them, escort them to the hospital. Sometimes I got to leave that unit unattended. And it take like two or three minutes to take them to the hospital. I come back. You know, I'm going to watch your cell doing, man. And he ain't going to tell because he ain't there getting violated or penetrated or whatever, he's not gonna say nothing until he get out or one of them get out, then he come. Even the cellies next door, they don't even know, man. You you can't. So when a lot of people say that we don't care, it's impossible, man. We, we, we put in a situation that we can't win. As correction officers, because we so understand and they put case up. Because when I first went, when I was working there, man, it was like we had, the unit I was working, we had like four people working when they first opened up the NRC. It was four people working. One on each side, you had a rover, and you had one person in the tower. And that went to me being the person in the tower, the rover. It went from four to one pe person, man. And it's hard, man. If you work two units next to each other, you got to walk out one door. So like I say, we can't, we can't do that, man. We can't watch that, man. Not making excuses, but we understand, man. And a lot of times, we don't get cooperation from, from our um, administration. Because they set us up for failure, and you try to sit here and reason with the inmates, but uh, they frustrate because they don't, they looking at me like, well, you are on life source, but I got like two to three hundred people. I'm all y'all life source. I just can't see here and cater to you. I got to cater to everybody, man. But that's my close remarks. And my close remarks is people, please fight for your family before they get in that system. Because it's unfair on these streets. The police department is unfair. And especially that court system is really unfair. And that penitentiary is unfair and unforgiving. And that's all I have to say, man. Okay. Thank you, Brother Chris. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, since you want to say something. I would like to say my brother's case was thrown on him when he got into um, the Minnesota, um, the local um, place, you know, the, the, the jail cell, and they was questioning him. He was coerced to sign the papers. So this case, he was, he was uh, threatened that um, if he don't say what they wanted him to say, that they will put a case on Major Malone Clark, which is my other brother. So the corruption is at an all-time high. And like I said, when he do get out, because I want to say this and I want to believe that he will see light again. And when he do, um, it's, it's, it's going to play out. But my brother was wrongfully convicted this time like i said he's not no saint he comes from a well-educated family um my mother and father did the best they could for five kids and i give praise and honor to them too 45 years of marriage 
Um, we, we stayed in the south side of Chicago, Woodline Gardens. Everybody knows us. Everybody knows our, our family, our family dynamic. Uh, what he did was on his own uh, will, you, you see. But this time, it was wrong. And he was wrong, wrongly convicted, uh, wrongly slammed. Um, like I said, the beatings and the mistreatment is just it's unnecessary. And I am going to make sure, as long as my feet stand on the concrete, I will make sure that justice is, is served for my brother. Okay, I don't mean to. Um, but thank you, Mr. Martin, for letting me on your platform. Um, I like to say that I'll be your protege. Um, anything you need from me, you will get. All right. I have one question. I showed enough okay. to use a little help. Go ahead. You want to say something? I just, Chris, I was go like, ahead. and I'm not trying to go against you. Nothing. What did you do for your brother before he got in that situation? When you say, uh, you, you, you did say earlier that he wasn't the best of the citizen. What did you do to try to help him and correct him or scold him for not being, walking that um, straight and narrow path? That's a good question because I stay 6140 South Rexel and my brother came to visit me. And I spiritually seen, I said, he said, I'm going up um, to Minnesota because he was uh, dealing with a case. Um, his baby mother, uh, her daughter stabbed him from, from the neck. So he was uh, fighting the case to get her prosecuted for uh, assaulting him. And um, I said, I need you to come back. I need you to stand your ground, do what you have to do and come back to your family. Because the most high already gave you three chances three chances. When he got up there, uh, before he left my home, I said, you're not coming back because I felt it. And that was the last time I seen him. So I talked to him and he said, sis, you're very intelligent. And he told me that he was sorry for not protecting me. I said, no, you have to protect your soul. Because where are you going? Uh, and I want to say this before this even happened, my grandfather was in St. Bernard. And before he died, he, he told my brother, he said, I need you to change because you're going to be locked up or you're going to be dead. And he died after that. When my brother left that home, it was cold blue and my grandfather ascended to another celestial realm. But what I did as a little sister, and I was very young then, I said, I need you to stay out. You, you, are, you are the uno nuno. You're the firstborn. And I need you to stay out because... You have a son, you have a, you have a sister, you have several siblings that need you. And he said, okay, okay. I said, don't say, okay, make it right. Make your wrongs right. Because when God gives you that ability to set you free, then you should have been on a straight and narrow because he's not going to give you too many chances. Then you had an elder to tell you, you had a little sister, your mother and your father sat on them hard benches gave you the best of the best see we stayed in a household where it was not chaos it was order he had mother and father throughout the vicinity i see my friends were not uh just a mother there as strong as she was no fathers so he had that support you know he chose to do some things that uh wasn't um higher self um and he was taught right from wrong so we were always there for him you see um but as a for a sister speaking i have tried to pray i've tried to talk to him i've seen him go through so much you know so the structure was there because i cannot stand on the platform and say that my mother and father did not do but you don't know which way your child will go See, right. your child is born through the canal, but your child is placed at the heart. So as a sister, I sat and talked to him, and he couldn't be, he was just all done. He said, I can't believe you saying this. I said, I've seen you come and go. Three is a powerful number. He was let right. three times. But, so this time, they set you down. They decided your fate, not fate. One man decided where you would be. No, I, I think I think it was more than just one. I think it was a um, a collective effort with the police officers, the the state's attorney, PD, and the judge. So I don't think it's just one. But my thing too, 
But my sister, the advice I give you, yeah, invest and help your brother, but also know you have to live your life too. Make sure that's important. You got to take care of self first. Cause I, cause I got a, a sibling out there that's not on the up and right. And I caught myself by consuming my whole life to make sure that they was okay. But I had to step back. Sometimes you got to step back and take care of yourself, yourself first and re re energize because you burn yourself out you would so that's a, a some advice. don't give up never give up on your, your siblings but sometimes you gotta take a step and re-energize and collect your thoughts and go out in a different way okay huh? yeah blessings yeah blessings. Uh, blessings she said all right, I'm going to end it right here, people. This is live, uncut, unedited. I want to thank all my special guests. I want to thank you, Chris. I want to thank Mark Clements. I want to thank Earl. I want to thank my dear sister. She got in contact with me. We jumped right. We jumped on it right away, right away. See, she didn't know who she was talking to at first, though. But then when she went to my profile, you know, I got the cartoon pitch up there. But when she see my face, she's like, yes, I remember. I knew she was at all the time when I was talking with her. So she's going to be working with me. I'm going to work with her. And people, we're going to have a special, another special topic like this. People that's been in the prison system, people that's fighting the prison system, people that worked in the prison system, people that have been locked up in the prison system, system wrongly. So I'm going to do, I'm going to put something together, Chris, real big, man. Okay. So if you can get some of your uh, friends and stuff like that that's retired, Cause we don't want nobody to lose their job. We want them to come over and tell the truth and shame the devil. It's hard. Man. I know it's hard. It's hard. I know it's hard. It's hard. But they could call in. And it'd be anonymous. Yeah, it'd, it'd be, be anonymous. Yeah, they, okay. Yeah. yeah. It'd be anonymous. Okay. All right. I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna get this live off here. Thank everybody once again. I'm out of here. Peace out. Thank you, sister, so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>